like that worship group this morning, huh? And what's really amazing is that is the first time they have done Sunday morning worship together. They practiced the first time Wednesday night. So um, just kind of put out there again, sound like rolling thunder up here. I know it's going to take a while to get used to back there. We're, we're going to get there. Um, if you're interested, if you've got, you know, if God's given you gifts and talents to, to sing, to play, talk to Stephen. Um, he, he would love to talk to you and see about getting you involved in what goes on up here. This morning is Easter. And as I was praying and asking God, what would you have me bring? Let's see, Dave, we're still getting a little too much echo up here. May I have to back it down just a little bit yet? There we go. Uh, as I was asking God, what would you have me bring to this congregation today? And I've been praying about this for a long time. I just felt led to share my story. So go to sleep. I hope not. I've got a little prop up here I'm going to use to help me. It'll take me just a moment to move everything in place. And, and uh, my son asked me this morning, Dad, are you going to lift that thing up there all by yourself? I said, you know, Jesus, could, or I didn't say it, but I was thinking about it. If Jesus could carry the cross, I can lift one, okay? But uh, to be honest with you, these things are not light um, at all. <clears throat> by the way, this is plenty large enough to crucify someone on. And it is heavy. You get the idea. This is one of my main props this morning. I'm gonna got a whole cart of things back here we're gonna be using, so I gotta bring it forward too. A little different, but I like telling stories with pictures. I used to be a photographer, it kind of goes without saying that that would be a natural fit. So we'll just set that right there. Well, this is Easter, and uh, Easter kind of starts with a cross and ends with an empty tomb. Of course, you notice the cross is empty. It couldn't hold Jesus. You know, there's some people who look at the Catholics and say, well, they've got the crucifix. They've got Jesus still on the cross. Don't they know he came down? Yes, they know he came down. Okay. The crucifix simply reminds them of what he went through for us before he came down. The Protestant church generally show the cross empty. We remember that he is no longer on the cross. Either one's okay, all right? Um, I want to share a little bit what this cross means to me. A little bit of my personal story. I was born into a religious family. A family that was in church every week. You know, we, we learned to say our prayers. First time I said the Lord's Prayer, I was quite young, and I was rewarded with a basketball. You know, our priorities were right. Um, religious family. And uh, in, in our kind of faith system, and I'm not saying this is exactly what the church taught, but this is how I understood it growing up, and my family kind of thought about it is, that, uh, yeah, you know, the cross is important because it separates heaven and hell. But, but the cross was sort of, if we can think of it this way, the cross was more like a big, of course I'm going to be tangled up up here, look at this. The cross was more like a big balance. And uh, pull that out, now it'll work. The way I, I grew up believing is that God is going to weigh in a big scale, and, and depending on which way it tips, is going to determine whether or not we go to heaven or hell. See, it was a big balancing beam to me. And so I kind of thought. You know, in, in my way of thinking, and again, I, I was young, I realized that, that it was about good versus evil, the good things we do during, versus the bad things we do. And, and when we sin, it's like putting a weight on this side. Uh-oh. And I sinned again. Uh-oh. And we keep sinning, and we keep adding weight, and the beam is in trouble. But, of course, it is a balance. It is a, it is a balance beam up here. We, we can offset the evil we do by deciding, hey, you know what? I'm going to do good deeds. Now, you notice the uh, incongruity in my mind. <laughs> See? You can do a lot of bad things, and you can offset them with, like, one good thing. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice if that's how easy it was? Well... 
course, the, the problem is that you know, we didn't have one of these sitting around our house that you know, we could look at every day and say, better do some good deeds today, I'm in trouble. It didn't work that way. We had to, you know, you wait till you die. And then when you die, you find out if you were good enough or if you had more in here than you should have had, and you don't make it to heaven. You know, there's a lot of people that think along those lines. I was not unusual in that regard. If we're good enough, we get to heaven. If we're, if we're bad enough, we don't. And that's the way I grew up and what I was believing. But, you know, again, a religious background. I, I grew up, I mean, you talked about any kid that knew me back then when I was young. Most of them thought I was a Christian because I acted better than most of the Christians around me. Not because I was motivated to do what honored God and pleased Him and, and things like that, but because I believe this. And since I didn't know where that scale was balanced at any one time, I wanted to make sure I was putting enough over on this, the good side, that it would outweigh whatever was over here. So I really tried to minimize what went on this tray and maximize what went over there. I was a really good kid. Now, the fact my dad was the town cop kind of encouraged that a little bit, too. Because <laughs> trust me, when your dad's the town cop, you don't get away with anything. It doesn't work. But as I grew a little older... I began to question things because we moved to a town that didn't have the same church that I, I was born into and that family. And we started going to different churches. And, and over a period of time, I was hearing different things being taught in different churches. And it was kind of confusing. I began to wonder what this was all about. And, and so I tried examining different claims. I started studying uh, a little bit about Catholicism and various Protestant faiths. And then I even started studying some non-Christian faiths and tried to understand what is it they teach? What do they do? What do they believe? Why? And I wasn't finding satisfactory answers at all. And, you know, when you ask questions, you don't get answers. Which is part of the reason I don't like if somebody asks me a question, I, I'm going to try my best to give you an answer. Because one answer that doesn't float with me is, well, you're just supposed to believe it by faith. That's not an answer. That's a cop-out. Okay, we have reasons to believe. We're told to always have, always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have. We're to always be ready to answer. So I was studying, I was learning, and people just couldn't answer my questions. And, and I began to think, this is just all a bunch of nonsense. Now, I had a few friends, a few classmates, who were Christians, and they were living the Christian life. They were the real deal. And I, I was always kind of nice to them. I mean, they, they were sincere in their faith, even though I thought they were crazy. Um, but the others were a bunch of hypocrites to me. And I made fun of Christians. I teased them. I tried to prove them wrong. I came up with all kinds of interesting explanations for how the miracles of the Bible could have been done. I got real creative because I, I love to argue with people, and, and that was just fun to do. It really was. So there's no way I was going to believe that stuff. I wanted nothing to do with these, these fools. But then in high school one day, here it comes. I met a girl. <laughs> I met a girl. I got this big one over here, okay? <laughs> Met a girl. She's about 5'1", maybe 100 pounds, soaking wet. And she was a Christian. She lived her faith, active in her church, in her youth group. Well, I asked her out. There was one little problem. See, I, I was a senior in high school. She was a sophomore. Now, most sophomores by that time, you know, were 16, 18 to 16. That didn't seem too bad. Actually, I wasn't quite 18 yet, still 17. Well, she was the youngest kid in her class. She was still 15. So here I'm asking out a 15-year-old, and oh, I didn't realize she was that young. Her parents said no, for good reason, okay? <laughs> not that I was a bad guy. I don't mean it that way, but I mean, common sense, right? They said, no, you're not going out with this guy. But, you know, I, I kind of kept after her a little bit. And, and finally they said, well, tell you what. He can go to church and youth activities with you. Boy, I wanted to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I had a choice to make. If I wanted to be with this girl, I had to go to church and youth group. It was the only time I was going to get to see her, other than, you know, seeing each other in the hallways at school or something. So I decided, yeah, I'll, I'll go to church and youth group, and then I'd argue about everything the pastor had to say. You know, sit there and hear the youth, the youth leader. His name was Jeff. I'd listen to him, and I'd, we, we'd get out, and I'd argue about everything he had to say. And I'd listen to the pastor, and I'd go home and argue about everything he had to say. I was just all a bunch of baloney. Didn't want anything to do with any of it. Well, a short time after I started dating her and 
going to this church, her youth group decided to join an area-wide youth rally thing, and they were going to go to an all-night bowling party. I thought, okay, I can do this. We get to be together, you know, for a long time and, and go have some fun bowling and everything else. I said, well, we're going to have a, a gym night, and, you know, games in the gym and everything else, and then we're going to go bowling. Okay, it's the old bait and switch. <laughs> you know what? They were trying to get me there so they could preach at me. I got mad. Because I get there at this youth rally, we're here in this gym, we've been having games and fun and everything else, and this guy gets up to speak, and we're all supposed to be quiet, and I'll come and listen to him. Boy, I got upset with that. I felt they lied to me. And I'm listening to this guy, and he's going on, and I am just getting upset about the junk he is saying. The claims he's making about the Bible. But this guy is an absolute heretic. And then he said something that really burned me. He does this thing, he asks, uh, how many of you in here know for sure that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven? I'm going, nobody can know that for sure because we don't know where the balance beam is. Nobody can know. That's silly. I thought I was in a group, I thought I was in a cult. I wanted to get out of there. You know, because when he asks the question, how many of you know for sure tonight, if you died, you'd go to heaven? And of course, it's one of these things, everybody put your head down and your eyes closed on, no looking around. I'm going, oh, what is this stuff? If you know for sure, if you die tonight, you go to heaven, raise your hand. And I, I peek, and there's people all around me raising their hands. I'm going, oh, no, I'm among them. <laughs> and then I looked at my girlfriend, and her hand was up, and I wanted to go, no, don't do that. Nobody can know if they're going to go to heaven. And then the speaker said, uh, I dare you to prove me wrong that you can know. The Bible says you can know for sure you're going to go to heaven, and I dare you to prove me wrong if you don't believe it's true. Well, I believe the Bible was true. I hadn't really read it. I argued against it a lot, but I believed it was true. I mean, why not? I, I believe it's the Word of God. God revealed himself to man in this book we call the Bible. Fine. So I took him up on his challenge. I said, yeah, you prove to me. You prove it. You can know you're going to go to heaven. So I went up, and they had counselors up there, and sure enough, I ended up with the counselor of our youth group, Jeff. And he sits me down, and he opened the Bible and started telling me about what it says. And you see, I learned some things that night in sense, and one is that my religion had some serious flaws. Because, you know, I was thinking, you know, my, my sins were these little pebbles. But, you, you see, again, I have a problem, because it says in James chapter 2, for whoever keeps the whole law is a really good person, in other words, but stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So, I thought these were little pebbles, but the truth is, every time I did something wrong, I was guilty of being a lawbreaker and breaking all of the law. Now my righteousness doesn't seem so good, does it? See, this is what I learned. If you break even one little thing, you're guilty of breaking all of it. Ouch. That's trouble when you believe it's a balancing act. Then Jeff showed me Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, I knew that. Nobody had to tell me that. Because as good as I tried to be, I knew I wasn't always good. We've all sinned. We've all done bad things. And if you've done even one little bad thing in your eyes, God says you've broken my whole law. And you deserve to go to hell. That's not what you want to hear when you believe this is how you go to heaven or you don't. I said, okay. So even the little things we do, we're in trouble. But, you know, I do some really good things, too. I mean, I was a Boy Scout. I'd help the little ladies across. I, do, no, but <laughs> I was a good kid. I did a lot of things. I thought, well, if all those little things are this big, I mean, if what I think is this little tiny thing is really this great big thing, well, then, you know, that's not right either. The truth is, this is what must be what my good stuff is, and I'm still back in good shape. So I had this all figured out, didn't I? Do enough good deeds, and even if the bad deeds are really big things, enough good deeds, I'm going to get to heaven. So I wasn't too worried. But Jeff kept talking. And he kept showing me the, what the Bible has to say, the thing I believed to be true, just didn't know what it said. And he said, you know, Brian, it doesn't matter what you believe, the Bible says it's not good enough. Because in Isaiah 64, it says, all of us have become 
like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts, all the good things we've done, are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. And all the things that I thought were good deeds aren't going to do me any good. In fact, if anything, because I had pride and arrogance, they just make this side worse. And he says, all my, the things I thought was so righteous are as filthy rags. I got a little illustration for that. <laughs> By the way, the original language, this is not that far off, except it's a little worse than this, okay? This is kind of accurate. It's like this and worse. And you know what? I don't care how much of this stuff I put on this side. I'm not going to outweigh that, am I? And the Bible says that all my righteous deeds are filthy rags. And when I break even one little thing, I'm guilty of breaking it all. I'm in trouble if this is true. If what I believed my entire life up to that point is true, at this point I'm 18 years old. If I believed up to my entire life what I believed is true, there is no way I'm ever going to heaven. I'm going straight to hell. I have no hope. It doesn't look good. Of course, Jeff didn't stop there either. Romans 5, 6, and 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, and remember, you know, even this isn't true because it says that all this is just blown away. Okay, so we have nothing on that side at all that means anything to God. While we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why the cross is so powerful. Christ died for us. This is the truth. It's not my good deeds and my bad deeds that are weighed. It's my bad deeds, which is everything I've ever done in God's eyes virtually, to the one good thing Christ did for me. He died on the cross to pay for my bad deeds. And he died on the cross to pay for your bad deeds. And that's the most important message I can ever tell anyone. It's not about good versus bad, because all our goodness is no good. See, we have to go a little bit further. We can accept this is true. We can believe this is true. But Jesus one day is talking to Nicodemus, one of the religious leaders of his day, a Pharisee, one of the respected religious leaders. And he told Nicodemus as they were talking, he said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, Nicodemus' response to that was kind of like mine when Jeff read this to me. How can I be born again? I'm not a baby anymore. I can't be born again. That's silly. But that's where our language kind of breaks down. It actually means to be born anew. A new kind of birth. Not just a physical birth. You see, I was born the first time into the Balassa family. I was born a physical being into the Balassa family. First born of my family. That was a physical birth. Jesus said, that's fine, but you also need to be born a spiritual birth. You need to be born in your spirit because God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. God is spirit. And he wants you to be born into his family. So we've got some good news and some bad news both here. Because John 3.16, we all know, but I'm going to read the next couple of verses too. Because we tend to stop a little shy of the bad news. The good news is 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the good news, isn't it? See, God sent his Son to die to pay the penalty for my sins. That is the best news in the world. That's great. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that part I love. But... We need to take that just a little further because he didn't stop at verse 16, as we find in our Bibles. 
Jesus went on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And again, that's what we're looking at here, and it makes so much sense. But then he says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But, here's the bad news. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, I can look at this and say, okay, fine, Jesus died for my sins, but never really believe it, never really put my faith in what he did. And some people say, well, I have faith. And you say, well, give me an illustration of faith. And they'll pull out a, a great big old chair and they'll sit it down and say, well, see, faith is I'm willing to sit in this chair. How much faith does it set, take to sit in a chair that we know is made to hold us? It just doesn't take faith. Faith is when you're willing to give your life to something. When you are willing to say, I believe so much that I give everything. I'm willing to put everything on the line. You know, years ago, there was a, one, one of the very first skyscrapers was built. It was all glass. You know, if you ever been to the big city and see these all glass skyscrapers, you kind of wonder how they're built because all you see is glass. The walls are glass. And one of these was built in this large city. And they had all these cubicles up here in this one small area. And over here, right along the side, was the copy machine. And they made sure when they laid out the cubicles that everybody could very easily exit their cubicle, walk down along those glass walls, and get to the copy machine. They left those paths right there, you know, nice view and everything. Walk along the glass walls, go to the copy machine. And they found out they were having a problem. Because somebody would be working in a cubicle over here, all he's got to do is walk down along the glass wall, go over to the copy machine, no problem. Instead, you know what he's doing? He's turning around, he's walking all the way around, this whole set of cubicles, every time, goes to make his copy, goes all the way back, when right there's a shortcut, he won't take it. Because he didn't have faith that the glass was safe. So they brought in a structural engineer. And he laid out the plans, the blueprints. He said, look, this glass is safe. It's as strong as a solid wall. Here's, here's the test we've done on it. You can, you can fire a softball at 150 miles an hour into this glass and it won't break. Whatever the numbers were. You know, and everybody's going, okay, I see. We, we believe now. We believe we're safe walking along that glass. We believe the glass is safe, no problem. Do you think they really believed? <laughs> Copy. <laughs> Every time. This happened two or three times. They brought in all these experts. It never changed a thing. They all knew in their heads it was true. They could look at the plans, they could look at the test, they could look at the structural analysis, they could look at the stress analysis, and they knew the glass was safe up here, but not down here. They really still didn't believe. And they brought in another expert. And one more expert, why not? He lays out the plans, he shows them all the tests, and they else go, yeah, 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 we believe, we believe. He knew they didn't believe. Do you see the correlation here? People believe this, but they don't really believe. And he says, I believe. You know, all the people are sitting around, we believe you, we believe you. He says, you don't believe me. And he got back. I'm not going to do it because I'd fall off the end. <laughs> or I'd come up here. He gets way back across the room. He runs full speed as hard as he can. And at the last moment, jumps and throws his weight with all his force into that wall, hurting his shoulder but bouncing off. No one ever failed to walk past that window again. See, they had to see it to believe it. They had to see it to believe it. Jesus rebuked Thomas, doubting Thomas, because when the other disciples saw him alive, Thomas says, I doubt it. I don't believe it. And then Jesus appears to Thomas, too, and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He believed him for who he was. And Jesus said, blessed are you because you have seen and believed, but blessed is he who does not see and yet We need to believe this. We need to put our faith in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth, if you confess, if you speak the truth, Jesus is Lord. He is my leader. He is the one I follow. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess. And are saved. 
As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone, hear that word? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter what you've done, how bad you've been. If you call on the name of the Lord and truly put your faith in him and confess him as Lord, you will be saved. And you will go to heaven. Not because of the righteous things you have done, but because of the righteousness of him who outweighs all our sins. In fact, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And God's sin, is, or God's forgiveness through Jesus is more than enough to cover the sins of the world. We are covered. The wages of sin is death. And when we read death in the Bible, it means going to hell. Okay, that's what the Bible means when it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that goes for... You know, you love an illustration when it stops working on you, don't you? Put that up there, I hope. It'll stay. There we go. So the truth is, eternity is in the balance. For every one of us, eternity is in the balance. But as they say on TV, wait, there's more. You see, you turn, we, we, I could sit up here, I could put on my, who's that guy that died recently that was the infomercial guy? Yeah, but Willie Mays. I could put on my way, Willie Mays things like, let me tell you, we got an incredible deal right here because if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved regardless of what you've done over here. But wait, there is more. <laughs> Nobody could beat Willie Mays, right? Or Billy, Billy Mays, I'm sorry. Um, as great as this is, because if we put our faith in Jesus, we do get eternal life. That's giving, you know, I, I, I grew up worried about going to heaven. I grew up worried about going to hell. I don't worry about that anymore. Because now when somebody asks the question, if you died today, do you know you would go to heaven? Yes, I do. Because God promises me. I have confessed with my mouth, Jesus is my Lord. I follow him. I've given my life to him. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead Easter morning. He is risen. He proved his power over death. I put my faith in him, and when I die, I'll get to go and be where he is, which is heaven. The Bible promises us that, and I believe it's true. So, yeah, I know where I'm going when I die. I don't have to worry about it anymore. But the more is, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, we don't have to wait until we die and go to heaven to experience the goodness that... Jesus gave us on the cross that he made possible for us. We can enjoy it right now. Right now, we have the ability to have a fuller life, a richer life. It doesn't mean an easier life necessarily. But God is going to walk with us right now. Jesus changed my life. When I put my faith in him that night, when I was 18 years old, he changed my life. My life, not just my eternal life, but my life right now today. So what's happened since that day? Well, that gal I was marrying, we dated three years, or dating, we dated three years, and I married her. We're in our 29th year of marriage with three children. Jeff is her brother. He's now my brother-in-law. We'll be having supper with him tonight. That crazy guy in that youth group brother-in-law. God changes lives. And again, not everything is always going to be easy just because you put your faith in Jesus. I mean, I nearly lost a son to cancer 10 years ago. Almost lost my daughter to another illness before that. Those aren't easy for any parent to go through. They're traumatic. They're devastating. We've had financial struggles like many of you have. Terrible financial struggles in our lives. We've made mistakes and we have paid terribly. Like Dave Ramsey says, I've made mistakes with zeros on the end. And I have. And I have paid the price. Bad things have happened. But you know what? When you put your faith in Jesus and you know your sins are forgiven and you know where you're going to spend eternity, that load is a lot easier to bear. I mean, it's one thing when I'm sitting there in the room and my, cancer, my, my son who has cancer is literally dying of a stroke before me. He had a stroke and he is dying, and they are losing him in the ICU. And I can sit back and say, Lord, 
We gave him to you before he was born. We formally dedicated him to you before the church as a baby. He put his faith in you as his Lord and Savior when he was a little boy. And if you choose to take him now, it's okay. Because I know I'll see him again. It makes a difference. Being a Christian doesn't mean we're in an airtight spacesuit that nothing can ever hurt us again. Being a Christian, a true follower of Jesus Christ, does not mean everything is always going to be easy, but it's going to be better than going through those same things without Jesus. He has come to give us a full life, and he wants us to enjoy it. So the question today is, one of the questions is, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins to pay the price for all the bad things you did that you could not ever be forgiven for on your own? Do you believe it? Not just here, but here. Have you received that gift that he gave for you? His own life. Do you confess that he is your Lord? That he is your leader? That he is the one you will give your life to? You know, I'll tell you something. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I was planning on being an electrical engineer. I was accepted to Purdue, Purdue University School of Engineering. I had my life laid out before me, what I wanted to do. God has a way to change plans. I ended up going to work for an electronics company doing the thing I wanted to go to college to learn how to do. A few years later, I started my own business, a photography studio. And God blessed me in that, and over 15 years grew it into one of the largest, most respected studios in my market area. God blessed me. Then he called me into the ministry. And I walked away from everything I loved and built and enjoyed so much, and he's given me fullness of life now doing what I do. And I would not do this for a moment if I did not know this stuff was true. I would not do it for a moment if it was not for the opportunity I have to try and help you if you have not yet done so, come to the point of understanding, like I did, what Jesus did for you on the cross. Do you believe, will you confess, Jesus is my Lord, and I will give my life to him and follow him? As we close today, I would like you to turn in your hymn books, if you would, to hymn number 300. It's a short hymn, just a couple of verses. I, you know, some people like these 25-verse altar calls and stuff, and I, that's, there's no point in that. Because you see, either God has touched your heart and your life, and you're saying, you know, I need to do what, what Pastor Brian did. I need to accept God's forgiveness. I need to accept what he did for me on the cross and let him be my Lord. Or you're going to walk out of here and it's not going to make any difference at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing just these two verses of this song. And I'm going to ask, if you would, if you've come to the point this morning that you said, I do believe, and I want to confess Jesus is my Lord. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. I want to ask you to come forward this morning. And we're going to have some other people that will come up here too. And I want you to just come up and tell them, I've accepted Jesus as Lord. So as we do this, I'm just going to ask, we have some people I've talked to and deacons and deaconesses, if you'd like to slip out and come up here just to be available, they can come up and tell you, I believe and I've accepted Christ as my Lord. If it's more of you, come on up. Deacons and deacons, just come up. Be available up here. If anybody would like to come up and confess to these people here before we leave today, I believe Jesus is Lord. I'm leaving here today understanding what Easter is all about. Jesus is my Lord, my risen Lord and Savior, and someday I'm going to be in heaven with him. These people are all up here to pray with you, to hear you, to allow you to speak to them. He's my Lord. And you will leave here saved completely. Would you stand with me as we sing? This is, we call it an altar call. It's just an opportunity. We're going to sing this just to give you an opportunity to come forward. That's why we're singing here today. For you to make this commitment to come forward and to put your faith in Jesus Christ, as I did. And I've certainly never regretted it. Let's sing this together. And I would just ask, as we're singing, if you want to come up and let someone know up here, confess Jesus is your Lord. We want you to come up here. Speak with them, allow them to pray with you, and to have a life changed before you leave here today. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world 
to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited. 